In this video, I want to show you how the UI in Houdini works. If you're a beginner, this will be great. If you're not, I would skip over this. So if you're looking at this for the first time, it may be a little cumbersome, especially if you've never touched a 3D program. But let me walk you through it. So first off, the biggest pain that you're going to see, or pain window is what I'm saying, is the 3D viewport. This is a representation of our 3D world and currently there's nothing in it. Now, one thing to note is there is a grid that's spanning an X, Y, and Z axis. The Y is actually up in Houdini, whereas some other programs, say Unreal, for example, have a Z axis that's up. Now, one thing to look at here with these numbers is from zero to one, this represents the actual scale of a meter. In other programs such as Maya, you may run into the grid system being put into centimeters. But right here, when you're in Houdini, you're working with meters. And so if you're ever curious of the scale of anything, let me just drop down a geometry node here. This, when I translate something, 1.2 means 1.2 meters. All right, so this is the, the viewport. And what you can do to navigate is hold down alt or spacebar on your keyboard and then left mouse click in order to move around. You can use your middle mouse button to zoom in and out. And if you click your middle mouse button, you can kind of pan in the viewport. Okay. So those are the main navigation tools that you'll need to know in order to just move around in the 3d space. Right now you're going to see several different icons up here. For the most part, you're probably only going to play with most of the icons right here. This, for example, is how to select some geometry in your viewport. And if you click here, you can move, rotate, or translate a certain object. And right here is a global transform handle. Now, first, I want to go over the, if you move this over here, I want to go over these two windows. So right here, we have our network where we can add nodes. Now, Houdini is a node-based software, so you're not going to have layers like in Maya or Blender or something like After Effects if you've used other creative 3D or maybe non-3D programs. What you would do is type in a certain node, and this is a geometry node here and we would place it in our scene here essentially but nothing is actually showing in the viewport and that's because if you dive into this object there's nothing there if you were to for example add a sphere then you're going to get a sphere in the viewport so i'm going to delete that that's where you can add different objects to your scene now that being said, let me add a box. And of course, this just added a object node. And inside that object node, there's a box. And there's certain parameters that you can control in order to change the size here. But then on top, there's also these parameters that will also change the box. However, these parameters on top are going to be global, or in other words, they're going to act on top of these parameters. So most of the time, you don't want to adjust the parameters when you're here at what's called the object context, which now will lead us into talking about different contexts. So Houdini, in a later lesson, I can go over each one of these contexts. But suffice it to say that you start by default in this object context, but typically you're going to dive in one layer deeper and be in a SOP context where you're going to be able to make different operations in order to change or manipulate the geometry inside your SOP. So that's what this pane, this window does right here is you can have all your different types of nodes that you're going to be working with, but typically you want to keep things abstracted a little bit. So for example, you may want to have a box, a node here called prep. And who knows, maybe this is where you prep a box and you could type in a null object and write out. So nothing's actually happening here, 
but if I turn off my prep here, this display node, nothing is shown in our viewport, but if I was to type in another geometry node here, and maybe I wanna say render object. If I dive inside here, I can use what's called an object merge node, and then grab that reference to the prep node. Okay, that prep node that was out here, I can grab that reference by just going up a layer. This notation here, this is as if I was going out of a file directory. So dot dot slash, I go up one layer, which means I'm here in this area. So to give you an, another example, if we had a node here called test geometry Tommy, if I go up one layer dot dot slash, we can see we have access to all these parameters that are here, okay? But if I was to start typing test, we see that we have can access Tommy right here because he's right there. But I don't wanna access things on this level. I wanna go up one more level. So back here, now if I just do that one more time, I can type prep, okay? And so now it's basically going inside the prep node here and we wanna access this node. So then we can just reference it by saying out, okay? So that's how you can work with different nodes in this object context and reference new ones and, and kind of make a clean setup in order to build off other things. So maybe you wanna prep something here, maybe you wanna import things, maybe your next could be you want to model and then texture and each, each step you could then have a reference to out and then import the object into the next one and it's always referencing it. So that's kind of a high level approach of how you can manage different nodes and things you're working on in Houdini. And of course, anything that's turned on display here will be manifested in your viewport. Again, these are global controls, global parameters that act on just these nodes. That's why if you jump inside every node in Houdini has different parameters that you can act on. So nodes, parameters, and what you see. All right. So next I would say what's important is this is what's called your shelf or the shelf tools when people refer to them. And it's basically your default settings of different nodes that are key inside Houdini. I don't really use these all that often. Sometimes maybe for modeling, you'll be interacting with an object, say this for example, but I would even be inside, I'd be, be selecting my box and say I wanted to, you know, put an edge loop here. What I could do is click edge loop and then it gives me the ability to put an edge loop in. And we see that that shelf tool interacted with my selected node and added an edge loop here, okay? So we see that we now have this box with this edge loop, but this, this workflow still is what's called a non-destructive workflow where we could turn this off, we could hit this yellow button here to bypass it essentially. So it's as if that node doesn't exist and that makes it so our set up almost everything in Houdini is pretty much procedural in that matter because procedural meaning you can just always go down the chain and re retrace your steps, okay? So these tools up here are just your shelf tools in order to do different operations, different nodes. And then over here, we also have a set of more tools and you'll, you'll even find more effects-based tools or different custom setups that you can just click on and it will automatically create a setup for you to then maybe dive into and learn a little bit more about say how oceans or fireworks, okay? So you've got your tools up here, you've got your main viewport, we've got our parameters, we've got our nodes here. One, a couple other key panes to, to take notice of are your render view tab here which is where you can display different renders. And I would go over that later in a new video with them, um, how you render things out. And then you have a geometry spreadsheet. Now this spreadsheet gives you the raw data of whatever you're looking at. So if I go back in my scene view and I 
click on my box here, if I click on my spreadsheet, what we're actually looking at, and this orange is the selected edge loop here, but we're actually looking at the position of every single point of that geometry. So that takes us to our next spot. If I middle mouse click on this node, it gives us a list of attributes. So Houdini is really powerful because you can basically create whatever type of attribute that you'd like on your geometry. And so that spreadsheet is really key in letting you visualize what type of attributes you have and how they're interacting. You can use this view to then see other attributes, whereas currently we only have a position. But say I wanted to add a color to my geometry, I could plug this in here, and it is giving it a point color. So we are going to see now, if I middle mouse click here, we have a three float attribute, which is a vector, and CD, which is the standard naming convention for color in Houdini, we see that it is assigned the color RGB, to this asset here, okay? So that's gonna be key for later things as you work in Houdini, that it's all basically points, vertices, primitives, and some detail attributes. Detail meaning a global attribute that applies to the whole data set that you're working with. If you can manipulate these points and primitives, then you can almost create whatever you want. The trick is to learning how to manipulate those points and primitives. So that being said, that's kind of the basics of how the UI works in Houdini. Here at the bottom, I should actually just show this real quick. We have our play bar here. So if you're going to be animating things or playing things, you can press play here. This clock button, I'd always just kind of check that because that's what plays it in real time. The standard is 24 frames per second. If you want, you can hold down and click flipbook with new settings. This will generate a flipbook of any of your animations and you can specify a frame range. So maybe frames 10 through 50. And then you could specify a size. If you just uncheck that, it would create a flipbook of just your viewport and however things are animating throughout that frame range. Okay, so I'm gonna not do that right now. That would be to render something out quick, but I, I, I don't ever use that. If you wanna adjust your global animation settings, you can change the frames per second here, and you can change your start and end frames. I highly recommend always setting your start frames to 1001 and 1240 instead of the default one to 240. I'll hit apply, and that's because if you're working on any shot or project, there's many times where maybe you have to do something that occurs before the actual beginning of the shot. And so if you do this, say that happens, you could just maybe set your start frame range to 900, simulate or do whatever you need to at, at this beginning part before frame 1001, and then just treat 1001 as the start of your given sequence, okay? So we've gone over the tools up here at the top. We've gone over the parameters, the nodes, the viewport, and the toolbar down here. You can adjust this if you want to only preview a certain range, but this doesn't actually change your frame range. Lastly, you can you know save, hit different adjustments with these tabs. If you want to customize your own workspace, for example, I typically like to get rid of these and have just these this window set up because I think it gives me a better map as to what I'm working with. You can also just hit P in the keyboard, on and off P, and then you always have your that same parameter list. But this way, if I need to, I can just hit P really fast, navigate to my nodes, and change that. And say you wanted to save this layout for forever, you could save your current desktop as, and name it whatever you want, and then I think somewhere in your preferences, you could then designate what build or what layout for your user interface that you want going forward. So I really like this approach. I think lastly, what I'll go over with some of the UI elements here is there's some visualizer icons here. You can turn on and off your grid. 
Um, this lock is to lock a camera. So say you want to put a camera down, I can hit hold down control and left click and we create a camera. And so if I lock it, then that means it moves the camera around however I'm panning in my viewport. And if I unlock it, then I'll move, but it doesn't move my camera. So I'll look through my camera again and can lock it and change it. Okay, this changes the lighting to no lighting setup. So we just see a different result there without any lighting. And then if you have lightings in your scene, you can, you can change these different icons. If you don't want to visualize your material, you can turn that on and off. If you have a material on later, and then if you need to visualize the actual points on a geometry, you can click this point. If you need to see the normals, you can click this normals icon. This icon is for velocity vectors or point trails, meaning if you have velocity on a certain geometry, then you'll be able to see how that's interacting. These are point numbers and these are prim numbers. And last thing, I've probably said last thing like five times by now, but one of the last things is shift W will make your geometry wireframe show up or disappear shift W. So yeah, that's kind of the basics of what you need to know just getting started in Houdini. And if you are a beginner and you're watching this, you're probably only going to dive inside geometry networks and work inside of these anyways. And so I'm not necessarily going to go over these contexts right now because you'll learn that later. So if you're new, I would just dive inside here, maybe see if you can create something cool or model something real quick procedurally. And that'll help you kind of get the grasp of how Houdini works and to, you know, test out the waters and, it, and it's okay if you're stressed out or if you don't, don't, if you're having a headache about it, because that happens to all of us when you're learning a new software, but there's lots of resources out there in order to help. So just stick with it and you're going to be able to do really cool things. So if you've made it this far, you probably like it. If you could hit the like button, subscribe, do the whole YouTube thing. That'd be great. Thanks.